want to get your part of fame, there are missing a lot of lightning talks. It's your chance. I mean, uh, right now it's you have 100 percentage a chance to have this talk. So please put your proposal on the wall and you will be on stage. So we close the doors because we want to be in time and be prepared for the next talk. Please welcome on stage Bastian Weidelich. Hello. It's very nice to be here and see so many of you. That's awesome. So I'm here today to talk about how you can integrate third-party systems with your NEOS or Flow application. And I'm quite excited about this because that's one of my favorite topics of all time, really. And um, I have quite a lot of slides, so I have to rush through them a little bit. But before I dive into the topic, I like to cover some concepts and heuristics that I think are um, beneficial to the whole topic. So let's get started. So who can tell me what this is supposed to be? Container. Container? Yeah, maybe, or it could be a die or a 2D representation of a 3D cube. But it could also be just a square and two parallelograms. Or it could be just a collection of some straight lines. And you could take that further to the pixel or even atom level, of course. The point is, all these claims are correct, but they are on a different level of abstraction. And when I say abstraction, I mean you leave out or replace details in order to make communication more efficient. So in order to understand an abstraction, you need to fill out these gaps, and therefore you need some kind of shared context. So fortunately, humans are very good in deferring the context from the situation. <clears throat> so for example, if I say I had a swift ride uh, to Hamburg, you all know that I'm talking about a train ride and uh, that I didn't take my horse to get here. Or if I say I really enjoyed reading The Blue Book by Eric Evans, you know it, it's, it's not about the color of the cover I'm talking about. So that skill of deferring the context is really important for us, and especially for us developers, it's, it's important to be able to think abstract and concrete and to swap in between. Um, but when we talk to machines, we have to be very explicit, and we don't want machines to fill out these gaps, at least not yet, maybe some days in the future that will be different, but um, you might ask how that's relevant to the topic. <clears throat> I just think um, uh, it's one of the most important or at least most underestimated challenges of software de development because uh, abstraction or uh, context switching is so natural to us that we're sometimes not aware of it anymore. And I think it's really important to be aware of it, especially if there's multiple systems involved. So let's put this into perspective with some uh, practical example. And let's assume that we want to create a website for a conference like this one, possibly to be reused for the upcoming years, and with an API so we can feed some mobile phone application and whatnot. So how do you start creating a website? In domain-driven design, we have uh, some useful tools to get a shared understanding of the business we're creating um, a solution for, and that we create a, um, a so-called domain model. I guess you're all more or less aware what that is. Just to recap, it's not the database table, and it's not even that PHP class you put in your domain model folder. The domain model is just a thought. It's basically an abstraction of the real-world business. So we can visualize this domain model, for example, with a structure model like this one, and keep um, in mind that it's not the only visual representation of a model, and it's not the whole picture. Um, in this case, it's, it's good enough to get us started, um, so because then we can already see. We will definitely deal with entities like conference, venues, sessions, and speakers. And then you explore this model, and then you might realize, oh, well, we have different types of sessions, like keynotes and talks. 
and then um, you have uh, maybe uh, coffee breaks and uh, in general a schedule. Maybe you have promo codes for the hotels in the in the area, so you want to model this, and then attendees should be able to to vote on sessions. Um, probably you have some sponsoring options, and well, before you even realize, you end up with something like this. And don't bother reading this; it's uh, it's just a dummy. But I'm sure we all know these uh, historically grown mud ball models. Um, so. What to do about that? And I have to tell a little side story that um, the first time I met Robert, that must have been about 10 years ago now, uh, he was doing a presentation about the first steps of, of NEOS, and it was called Phoenix back then, or I think it didn't even have a name yet. Anyways, he, he, he asked the question, how do you create a CMS? Because it just seemed to be too big of a task um, to do. And um, he came up with a slide similar to this one. And he said, it, like you would eat an elephant. You just slice it into smaller chunks that you can swallow. And that's what we're going to do with the domain model. Um, and again, in domain driven design, we have a useful tool for that. And we create what we call the bounded context. I don't have the time to get into details. Um, but very roughly speaking, it's you take a model like this one, and then you split it up into, small, into multiple smaller models like this. And again, this is just an example. Um, in reality, it can be quite tricky to find out the right boundaries, and you have to keep adjusting them. But already like this, it feels much more manageable. Um, it's like we added another layer of abstraction, and it's easier to fit parts of the model in, in, in our heads. And also, it it's makes it easier to replace single individual parts of that. You basically create from one project, you make multiple sub-projects, so it's also easier to split that up into multiple teams. <coughs> so let's see how that is implemented. So in our case, for the conference website, for most of the entities we talked about, we want some browsable website page, so it definitely makes sense to create no type definitions for those. So I'm not sure if you can read that, but it's not so important. It, it's, it's a conference document no type definition with properties for the dates of the conference, and we'll have one for sessions, speakers, and so on. Nothing special, you know the deal. There's one difference, though, what I tried is uh, because I wanted to central place to interact with the, with the core entities, I create a PHP class for each of the entities. Um, the, the magic is in the, in the base class, it's not a lot of code, but it, it's actually just a wrapper around one node and turning it into a read model. So if you have an empty implementation class, already you get a, a magic getter for all the properties of the node. Um, I left out, I don't show the implementation of the abstract class. In general, I left out some implementations. If you're interested, the whole source code is, is uploaded and I'll share a link um, at the end. Um, but just to see an example, you can, of course, implement some basic uh, domain logic here. For instance, here the speaker model has a first and a last name, and we can add some convenience method to return uh, the full name. And then uh, we create a service class for each of these bounded contexts we created. And uh, don't be put off by the name. You don't have to call it uh, service. It's, it's basically just your single authority to deal with uh, entities of that uh, of that bubble of that context. Um, so again, I left out the implementation, but the important part is uh, the level of abstraction. So we have a session service with a method get sessions for speaker. It expects a speaker instance, and it returns an array of sessions. And all the dealing with nodes is done internally, so it's easy to refactor that. And um, uh, yeah, it, we just work on one level of abstraction here. Last step is we uh, make these services available uh, in Fusion, so we can use them in the Fusion prototypes uh, like this. So in, in, in your food templates, you never really work with nodes, but you just uh, work with these custom view models. Um, so um, yeah, that's just a rough example down there. And I know some of you prefer to have more control in Fusion, and that's totally fine, uh, um, as long as you follow the the best practices Dominique and Dimitri 
just mentioned, uh, just keep it centralized, keep it on one level of, of abstraction, create components, that's also fine. I, I just, I'm just more the PHP kind of guy, and I, I like to have at least the core domain in PHP because I think it's easier to test, but that's up to you. So to see the current state in action, I recorded a short video. Uh, it's unfortunately, it's, I don't know, the resolution seems to be wrong, so it's not very clear, but I guess you still get the point. We can log in, and it's an empty website, but we can create a conference uh, page, and then we can uh, add the venue. Oh, that's really bad. Anyways, and we can add some rooms. And then we have a, a landing page for, for the speakers. And don't worry, I won't add all of them, just two, for example. <laughs> and then we can create uh, some sessions. Again, this is... So it's just an example, but if we can relate the sessions to one or more speakers, and um, there we go. And then lastly, we can create a, a schedule page where we have uh, time slots, and then each time slot can link to one session or a break. Um, it's not completely implemented, especially the rendering, but I guess you get the point. So. That's all to do, and then we can browse the finished website on the front end. Well, almost finished. Okay, so that's the current state, nothing really uh, exciting. But now, let's get to the integration part. Um, and when I say integration, I mean you take two or more systems and you make them behave as one, basically. So. A system can be anything from a PHP script or any script really up to a micro or web service uh, as long as it's behaving in independently. And um, you might notice that what we did before is already integrating because by splitting up the model into multiple models and then using the services to reintegrate them, that's basically integration. But right now they all share the same data storage, so that was quite easy to do. And usually a service has their own some state, and in order to integrate services, you need to keep that state uh, in sync somehow. So an important question to ask is, at what uh, point in time would you sync those? And I could come up with uh, three and a half uh, ways how you can synchronize services. And the first one is uh, lazy loading. Um, and I, I had to sneak in this little guy. Um, you probably know it from Doctrine, it's uh, where you, uh, um, well, you just talk to the backend as soon as you actually need the information. Um, so an example for that is, is in the nearest tone um, package by Dominique. It, it uh, uses the IBM Watson API to, um, to uh, analyze any content you manage in, in NEOS, quite a nice package. And it comes in two modes. One is a custom view for the property inspector. So it shows the characteristics of the selected texts uh, in the property pane if you expand it. And the second mode is a custom preview mode that renders these statistics um, in line. Um, both modes work lazily, so they never actually talk to the IBM APIs if they are not uh, expanded or activated. So some advantages of lazy loading is that it's quite easy to implement because you don't need to manage the state. Uh, you can just wrap the remote calls into a local PHP class and, and treat it as if it was a local st service. Um, also, it doesn't slow down performance on the right side because we don't make any uh, remote calls during the mutation. Therefore, in general, it's, it's quite gentle on resources, which is uh, useful if you, for instance, have a quota limit on the, on the, on the API and you only actually talk to the API if you re really need it. 
Some downsides are that the perf there's a performance impact on the read side, of course, because to read the information, we always have to reach out to the remote side, um, which can lead to bad user experience, unless you uh, cache the results, of course, which this package does, but uh, that obviously can lead to, the, to some outdated data if this remote side changed something and you still have the cached content. So the second way to sync services is uh, to immediately push any changes uh, to the re remote side. And one example for this is, to, is a simple package I created the other day. It adds, uh, it adds a new uh, type postal address, and you can use that in your property inspect, uh, in, so in your uh, node property uh, definition. And if you do that, you get a custom uh, inspector that displays the address, and if you create a new address or change an existing address, it will uh, use some configurable geocoding service to add the geo coordinates, and that's quite handy. We can use that to, uh, to display the location of, of the venue of the conference website on a little map. Um, and another example is a package you might know. It integrates MailChimp into Neos. And it comes uh, with a custom backend module that allows you to, to uh, manage your newsletter subscription. Uh, and it comes with a, a form finisher that lets you turn any Neos form into a, a newsletter subscription form. And so I added that as an example to our website as well. Um, and both uh, packages instantly communicate with the remote services as soon as the local state changes. Um, so that's also quite easy to implement. Again, you can just wrap it in a, in a, a cl local class. Um, also, you get an instant feedback. So in the, in the address editor, uh, you might have seen this little checkbox. So if the geocoding worked out, we get a little green checkbox and we see everything worked out. Um, also, we don't slow down performance on the read side because we only intercept um, during some mutation. And that's also one of the drawbacks, of course, because uh, that means whenever we change the address, for instance, we have to uh, use the geocoding. <clears throat> and then if something goes wrong on either the local or the remote side, uh, we basically crash, which is for the address editor probably not such a big problem, but for the newsletter subscription, for instance, uh, you might lose customers because they uh, if MailChimp is down and the subscription didn't work, maybe they don't bother to fill out the form again. And the worst thing, you might even not, not, not know about it as unlong, uh, unless you implement some logging mechanism. So a more advanced way to keep multiple systems up to, uh, in sync is uh, to use asynchronization. So, <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> this one's so. So instead of uh, communicating with the remote side during the same request, we actually uh, synchronize uh, sometimes after we, the state have changed. Um, so I, I didn't include a particular example, but um, uh, you should have a look at the job queue packages if you're interested in that, uh, that basically allow you to turn any method call into an asynchronous method call. And um, I had to skip some slides here, but. Uh, if you're interested, look it up. It's quite well documented and it's, it's good fun to work with. So asynchronization, uh, read and write stays fast because we can defer the remote communication. Also, it's easier to dispatch events to um, multiple uh, remote services. Um, imagine doing that in an instant synchronization. That would really uh, decrease performance and, and risk uh, reduce stability, really. So in general, we have an increased stability, uh, or we have the option to increase the stability because we can retry failed transactions. Um, obviously, you have to implement that, but it's possible. But as you know, uh, PHP only lives uh, during the request, so we need some separate thread that has a background worker running um, that picks up new tasks and handles them. Um, also, you don't immediately get results, obviously, because they're done in a separate thread. So errors might pile up in the background unless you really have good tooling there. So you risk that you have a state that is not up to date anymore or even uh, corrupt. 
All right, a variation of asynchronous communication is uh, polling. So instead of reaching out to the service, uh, we actually publish events. And then every service that is interested in those can subscribe. And, and polling might sound old school to you, but actually it's, it's the most stable way to communicate because um, e if either the, lo the local or the remote side is down, as long as the, this event is published, we can always um, recap. We can, we can replay uh, missed events and, and update the state there. So that's actually uh, yeah, worth uh, looking at that. And again, I didn't put, uh, include an example, but um, well, Robert's talk right after this session will briefly cover it um, with the whole event sourcing um, topic. There is a, this NEOS event sourcing package, brand new, still under development and not very well documented yet, but it's already used in production and works out quite nice. All right, so polling has the same advantages as, as uh, asynchronous uh, communication in general. It's uh, fast because we don't intercept any calls. It's even easier to broadcast it to multiple clients because we don't even have to know about them. We just publish our events and they can listen to. Uh, it's very stable because we can recover from failed transactions, but it's not very easy to introduce into existing uh, code bases because it really requires a different approach, a different mindset, and also the remote side has to uh, support that. Um, again, it also requires a separate background worker and definitely good monitoring and logging tools because otherwise you might end up in a big chaos. All right, so if two systems need to talk to each other, they need some kind of contract. Um, so there's countless communication protocols out there, and I'll just cover uh, two popular ones. The first one I'm sure you're familiar with, REST. Um, so I will jump to conclusions directly. It's a very stable architecture because it's based on one of the, if not the most uh, popular protocols out there. Um, it's stateless, so it's easy to scale because every request is self-contained. You can cache uh, requests, you can uh, load balance them to multiple backends. Um, in general, the tooling support is very good because uh, we can use all the built-in tools of HTTP, namely caching, auth uh, authentication. Um, yeah, and there's loads of libraries out there, of, of course. But then, because it's based on HTTP, it's also somewhat limited to HTTP, which is mostly not a problem, <clears throat> because HTTP is quite a, a well-established protocol. But sometimes, uh, um, in some scenarios, a different transport layer protocol uh, might be useful. And then, not really a fault of the REST spec, but uh, it's really easy to do CRUD with REST and well, don't get me started, but CRUD is mostly not what you want. And uh, last and least, uh, if you, especially if you have some custom requirements, uh, you need quite a lot of uh, HTTP round trips to get your result. Um, so personally, I never really got completely happy with uh, REST, um, and I really tried, I read a lot about it, and, uh, but it always felt a little bit awkward. Um, well, still obviously mo one of the most relevant ways to keep remote services in sync. Uh, but recently I had the chance to work with the new kid in town. Uh, GraphQL is a data query language uh, created by Facebook in 2012 to overcome some of the limitations of REST in order to, um, to drive their mobile phone applications back then. And then it got so popular that they actually made it available to the public as open source in 2015 and um, yeah, announced it as alternative to, to REST. Uh, and just note the little word alternative, it's not meant to replace REST and some people seem to confuse that. It's just a, a new tool in your toolbox. So there's an integration for, uh, that adds uh, support for GraphQL to your Flow application. Um, and again, I don't know if you can read that, but basically it's really easy to, to set up. You just install it via Composer and then configure some endpoint for the routing. And then you create a so-called uh, root query, 
And that is basically the endpoint of your API, or the entry point. So in this case, we have just a field called ping, and that returns a, a fixed string. And then the package comes with a nice little uh, JavaScript-based front-end UI called Graphicule, and that allows you to test your API, and it's, 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 it's great fun. It's, it comes with uh, type completion and uh, type descriptions, well, as long as you, uh, that you provide them, of course. Uh, and then you can just try it out in your browser, which is really nice. So to implement that in our conference website, we create um, a GraphQL type definition for each of the entities and their properties we want to expose to the API. And then we add uh, fields to the, to the root query. So here we have a, a conference object type with the properties uh, for this conference, and then we add some conferences endpoint that returns, maybe you can see that, a list of these new types, and then we can use our existing services to, to actually fetch these. Um, so that's all we need to have something like this. So we can list all conferences uh, with their titles and dates. So far there's only one conference in the system. But obviously the real power comes with deeply nested queries like this one. Again, don't worry if you can read it, but it, it, in this case, it's just an example. It lists all conferences with their dates, the venue with the geo coordinates, and their rooms, and all the sessions. And just with this little one query, so that's very powerful. Uh, GraphQL also supports uh, mutations. Um, and mutations, they work similar to queries in the implementation but they have a, simp uh, a completely separate entry point. Um, and I show that best with another example. And let's say we want our attendees to be able to, uh, to like sessions. So we create a, a mutation, just like the root query uh, we had uh, before. And then you see you have this resolve function that is always called whenever this field is uh, fetched. Um, and that does uh, all the mutation here using these services again. Uh, and it can return anything. In this case, for simplicity reasons, I just return true. In reality, you probably want to have some kind of result object with more information. Um, that's also an example of a, an argument. Each field can have arguments. So in this case, we expect an argument session ID. And we say it's non-null. That means uh, it's a required argument. Um, so if you want to like a session, you have to specify the ID of the session. And then obviously we only want registered uh, conference attendees to be able to vote, so we need authentication and authorization. And fortunately that's very easy to do with Flow. We just need a policy protecting the corresponding service calls. So we have a method privilege uh, that covers the add and revoke session-like method of the attendee servers. And then we only grant that to um, users with the role attendee. Um, uh, and that's, by the way, another good reason why you should have these central authorities to interact. So there should be only this one point where you add or revoke sessions, because then it's really easy to control um, yeah, access to them. And so we can also test the mutations with this GraphQL tool. We can even specify variables that are passed in. Um, and this will work out of the box if you're logged in uh, to the front of, end of the website because, well, it will just send the session cookie with the, uh, with the request. <clears throat> of course, if you use different authentication methods like a basic auth or JWT, then you would have to specify the header as well. So let's implement that in the website. Um, it's luckily quite easy to consume GraphQL with JavaScript. Um, so we create this uh, like button link, and we specify the current session ID and a, a data attribute. And obviously, we only, that only works if you're authenticated, so we can wrap it in some if access view helper, so the link is only shown if, I'm actually, if I have access to that session likes uh, privilege. <clears throat> and then the JavaScript um, this is slightly s simplified, but basically that's 
how it works. So you, you, you have a, a query, this mutation query, and then we can even pass in variables, and then we send that as an AJAX post request to the GraphQL endpoint. Um, and um, this is, as I said, a little bit simplified. In reality, we want to set some uh, classes on the button and so on, but this, this is the grid of it. And to see, you can always look up the real world's uh, source code. As I said, I'll share them. Uh, but to see it in action, I have this little video again. Let's see if that works better. No, nope, doesn't seem like. <laughs> Anyways, you should be able to see it. So right now, it's still, if you're not logged in, it's the same as before. But now I added this little uh, front-end login form. And if we use that to sign in and go back to the session list, you'll see that a little uh, like button. You can press it, and that's all you need to do. So that's quite easy to implement. And, and as you, you might have realized that the whole um, liking thing is completely separated from the rest of the domain model. So we didn't add some um, like on the session. It's a completely separate concern. And that also makes it much easier to reuse some similar functionality if you want to like um, different things, coffee breaks or something like this. So this is uh, quite flexible. If, again, it's this componentizing of things, you just keep them small and really dedicated to one, one concern. So the main advantage of GraphQL is probably uh, its, its type system. Um, it's, it's very convenient to work with that. Um, also, in, yeah, there's lots of different features, like you can deprecate types, and, and uh, so that this, is, this is really solid. And obviously, the support for these uh, complex and nested queries is, is, is a killer feature. And then one advantage that I, I really like is that queries and mutations are really separated on the top level. So that forces you a little bit out of this CRUD thinking into more of a processed, processed thinking. Um, so one could argue that it's uh, actually um, an advantage that a big company like Facebook is, is driving this because they have an interest in keeping it healthy, but I'm sure some people dislike the fact that it's Facebook. <coughs> also because they tend to um, ignore established standards like HTTP. So GraphQL is on purpose completely agnostic to any protocol, but that means we can't use any of the nice features from HTTP like um, caching or we don't get nice HTTP status codes from the back end. But in reality, it turns out that's not too much of a deal, actually. Um, and then lastly, there is no notion of links, uh, which is not a problem for the internal resources we can, because we can just uh, navigate through the type tree. But um, if you want to include external resources, um, there is no uh, link. Um, so. I, I didn't have problems with that yet, but that's something you should be aware of. So in general, I was very skeptical at first with GraphQL, but I really like working with it in practice. And I know that some other people I talked to had the same experience. So in case you, you didn't work with it yet, uh, I urge you to give it a try and at least um, add it to your toolbox, not as a replacement, but as a new option. If the requirements match. So that's all I could fit in to the 45 minutes. Um, uh, there's a link, as promised, to, the, to a little website where uh, the, all the slides are and all the links to the mentioned packages and resources. So thanks for listening. So I don't know if Sven is coming for questions, but if you have questions, yeah, you raise your hand. But is there a microphone? I have never done it myself, but the, uh, the graphic email company you mentioned he ignores HTTP, uh, HTTP. Does this have to complete both the GraphQL protocols? So the question was if a GraphQL actually really ignores HTTP um, or if it implements its own protocol. No, it's, it's not a protocol, so it doesn't implement a protocol. It's just the language, and then you have... Uh, the whole protocol thing you implement yourself. So you can still talk to it via HTTP, for instance, like we do with the HX request. But 
the language itself it, is agnostic to any protocol. It's, it, it doesn't... The, the, sorry? Okay, what defines the success of the error? Yeah, good questions. I had to skip that slide. Um, but for instance, if I would do, try to like a session and I'm not authenticated, then my backend would throw an exception, an access, access denied exception in this case, and those exceptions are caught, and then uh, GraphQL actually returns, instead of the data object, it returns an errors object where you get messages and status codes. And actually, we can extend that, and we uh, did that in, the, in that GraphQL implementation for Flow, so it also adds the, the HTTP status code, the, the exception would throw. You, you still get a response as HTTP 200, but in the, in the data you get back, you can still make sense of it. So that works. Any more questions? Yeah. Dimitri. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I'm totally mind blown by the second part of the talk and wanted to ask about the first one. Um, you used an eel, uh, you exposed your model via an eel service and in the previous talk uh, Dominique exposed his model via a like class of like custom implementation of node uh, yeah. class. So are there like pros and cons and why you choose to do it Very this good way. question, yes. Uh, actually, I, I didn't expose the model directly as eel helper, but, but just a wrappers around the service uh, um, classes. So uh, they return um, models, but, but I really want to have that centralized. But uh, yeah, custom, um, instead of wrapping each node with a custom PHP class, I could also use uh, a completely different um, node implementation. But as Dominic already mentioned, that is a kind of a minefield. Um, and because I always want to go through the services anyways, uh, for the reasons I mentioned, because um, it's easier to use them in GraphQL as well, it's easier to protect them via policies. Um, I don't need that because they, I can control what kind of classes they return. So it's, it's not an overkill to wrap these nodes. Also, uh, performance-wise, as you know, I mean, the, the most thing is most of this is cached. And that's, by the way, uh, also the reason this whole um, like button, I started creating this uh, as a view helper, uh, but that means that none of the views are cacheable because they have different output depending on the role. So this is a very nice way to do that un unobtrusively. Uh, we just render some the data we need and then do all the rest with JavaScript. Yeah. Any more? We have three more minutes. Three more minutes. If you have any questions, just raise your hand. Um, I didn't quite get how you separated the uh, liking aspect from the domain model. You said yeah. something about that. But maybe this is going too far, but uh, just yeah, curious. Yeah, I suggest uh, look up the source code. It's quite easy to understand, I think. But basically, it's, it's, I have this attendee service, and the attendee service knows how to or was it, yeah, I think, that, or we could also call it like service if we want. It depends on how you make the boundaries. But it's just, it's not like we have an, an instance of session and then we call a like method on it, but we, we just have a different service, say, a like service, like the session with this ID. So it's separated from the model. And that prevents you from having this grown model I showed in the beginning where you just add new features on top of the model and create this huge ball of mud. Um, by just separating these things. But again, okay. I, had to, I had to keep it very briefly, but it's, it's all in the source, so you should be able to see that. Thank you. Um, it's the last minute, so the last question. Hello, I have one question. Um, when you created the, the, the node types, you created a node type speaker, for example, and it was an extension of document, so it created uh, an element in the, in the page navigation. Mm -hmm. Um, on the other hand, if you created um, a time, tape, uh, time slot, it was just a normal node type uh, which was inline in the document. Mm -hmm. That's not really domain driven, that's kind of representation driven. Um, how would you, what's your way normally of, of choosing that kind of thing? And also, if you would create another example called category and it doesn't have any page, um, and can be included in multiple places, 
how would you do something which does not belong to any direct representation? Yeah, good question. So, well, the first part of it, why do I create document nodes in one part and content nodes in another part? I wouldn't say that's related to domain driven design, that's just related to the requirements we have for the time slot. I don't need for every time slot a website presentation for that, but for each speaker I want a landing page. And that's only my reason why I say, okay, this needs to be a document, no, this doesn't. So um, that part is, uh, is just comes from the requirements. <clears throat> the other question, what do you do with things that are not related to your core domain, if I get you right? Um, well, I, tend to, I, I try to see the website not as a collection of texts and, and you know, uh, if you have uh, an, uh, news articles, it's basically it's a, it's a collection of a header and a text and an image, but really add that to the domain. Um, and then you say, no, you have a news article, and then all these things get a meaning. Obviously, there are still parts like the menu that are not, I mean, you can say it's part of your website domain logic, but... Um, it's really helpful, for, for, I think it's really helpful to really have it specific. I really create, I don't, have, I don't have any page notes usually, but just really create a note type for every, every page there is, because um, that might, I mean, that you always have to find out the right balance between flexibility for the customer. They might want to be able to create completely new pages, but mostly that's a dangerous path to go. So you need to find the right balance, but it doesn't contradict you. Just find out the core domain. This is what your business is all about. So in this case of the conference website, the mentioned entities, this is my core domain. This is what I'm interested about. I don't need to call a model an imprint page. That's just that's part of the website domain. It's not so much interesting for the whole conference. All right. I think that's, yeah, we're out of time. Okay. You Thank have you. Have fun with Robert. Yeah, that was the last question. Please stay in this room. Thank you very much for your talk. Yeah, please stay in the room uh, to stay in flow. We want to make a fluid change uh, to the next talk. Um,